All right, let's continue on. We started with Todd Boley, part owner of the LA Dodgers and LA Lakers. And I am thrilled for this next one because this is about entertainment. These are folks I have dealt with before. I know they get how to do this. Danny Garcia, chair of the Garcia Companies and Jerry Cardinal, founder of Redbird Capital. Both of you, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you, love being here. Good to be here, Scott. Let me start with where I started with Todd. Because in sports, you can do everything right. And you're not so much the owner of the team, Jerry and Danny, but you can do everything right and still lose, not get the outcome you want. So I ask you, why do you put yourself through this hellish exercise? <laughs> well, well I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with a perspective. You know, it's, it's when you, you, the question, you do everything right and, and you still lose. Look, I mean, there's the, the, the first starting point is lose in terms of on the field performance and lose in terms of the business of sport. Uh, and I think doing everything right, you know, really commingles both of those. Obviously, you know, sports is about winning, but, you know, I think my view on winning and Danny and I are collaborating, as you know, on the XFL, our view generally, even at the league level, is there's winning in terms of putting a great product out there and, and the, the win and loss column being in our favor. And then there's winning in terms of, you know, the professional business around it. And one of the things that is really exciting um, about our collaboration together uh, with Danny and Dwayne and myself, and then generally what we've been doing at, at Redbird in sports is the, you know, the, the, the opportunity to continue to professionalize the business of sports and continue to bring scalable capital to that. And so I think that that I would say that balance is very important. How did the union come to be? Danny, walk me through how that happened on the XFL. How did this union come to be? Absolutely. It's a great union too, because it did come to be um, never in person. You know, we were looking at the XFL property. Uh, Jerry and Redbird was, were also looking at the XFL property in bankruptcy. And we were both so excited about the prospects of what could be. Uh, the art of possible with this brand in particular. And as we were circling around, I was hearing so much about this incredible individual and really getting an opportunity to know the Jerry Cardinal story and the Redbird uh, Capital Partner story. Um, and we knew that to do what we needed to do with the XFL, we needed extremely strong and innovative partners, like hands down. You just needed strength across the board. And so as we were looking at it, and we saw that Jerry also had an interest, it gave us an opportunity to meet and to talk about what do you see, what do we see? And we had viewpoints that just added to the bigger picture. And all of a sudden, you know, myself and Jerry, uh, DJ, were having these dynamic conversations and we were so comfortable with the fact that we were so like-minded. We were very clear in our ability and our desire to win and very clear in our desire for what we wanted the XFL to be for the fandom and for the players. And then through that, we kept talking, we kept discussing, and then we made a move together. In the parlance of business, am I, am I right in saying you were looking at a distressed asset that was a nice compilation of content and intellectual property? Is, is that right? And then from that discussion, what do you say we can do together? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it, that's exactly right. And in, in fact, I, I, I don't think I would have done this without Danny and, and Dwayne, um, because, you know, they, they bring a very unique set of um, talents and skills and experiences. They are intellectual property in and of themselves, and particularly in the crossing of live event entertainment, real intellectual property and content. That's how you have to approach this. And what, you know, what their, their vision really was to create a live event entertainment company rooted in legitimate football. And that, that Venn diagram is really exciting because I think we can each bring a lot to that in, from our various backgrounds. And so the synergy of that collaboration is exactly what you get, you're getting at in your question, Scott. And that's what's so exciting about this because that, if we can do that, that, that will have derivative implications for all, all sports and all leagues uh, globally, as well as in the United States, because you know, these are all multinational entertainment properties now. And you know, I think they, they're, all they're all grappling with the fact that they're real entertainment companies at this point, not just sort of hobbies or, or just sports teams or leagues. Yeah. Every time I talk to an owner these days or a commissioner, I keep talking about scale. 
Yeah, yes, in arena is important, but it's a it's the finite number of seats on a finite number of nights. That to, you guys don't like finite. You like infinite. So do you look at it in terms of technology and scale? How can I reach the entire world? And how do I grow beyond just the games that are being staged on the field? I think that Scott, that's absolutely right. The um, you know when you were talking about the earlier question about the wins and the losses on the field, and Jerry was re referencing well the wins of the business model and the scope. You know our background in entertainment and in live properties and in film is about the universe winning, right? The complexity. So for myself, for DJ, for Jerry as well, it's not difficult to be thinking globally on every property. Whenever we put our heart and soul into or say yes to a property, we're immediately starting with a global framework. So we don't have that learning curve that many owners or many individuals in the sports industry has. We're automatically looking that way and we begin building out in that manner. Can we have sort of an emergency board meeting of the XFL right now? If two makes a quorum, that's fine. You two have the discussion. What is the discussion now? Jerry, what do you say to Danny? Danny, what do you say to Jerry? Where are we? Where are we going? Look, it's, it, it's the same discussion that we had when we first decided to come together, which is, um, you know, how do we build a company that is, that is both a, the convergence of live event entertainment and sport? Um, and, you know, again, it's that what we talk about today uh, is exactly what we started out doing a year ago. And it's been a little over a year ago that we came together. And it's really the, the overlay of every, if everything that they do in terms of a, a real entertainment company with an engagement with fans that is global in orientation, that is delivering must-carry content. And you know, my, my input will be, how do we make this a company? How do we get this to pay for itself? Uh, and, and you put that together and that's where the magic happens. And we're in the middle of that right now. And you'll be hearing from us, as Danny will tell you, you'll be hearing from us you know, with an increasing crescendo over the next many months because we're, ready, we're, we're getting ready to start to debut some of the things that we've been working on. Danny, what's the market feedback been? What are you hearing from folks that you're pitching? Um, so from our feedback, what's interesting, what we continuously hear, especially in our relationships, is what's next? Where is it? What's happening? You know, there our partners, our media partners, our entertainment partners, our sports partners, our consumer product sports partners all have the confidence because they've worked with us historically. So they know what it means when we begin to add dimensionality to a very linear type of business plan. All right, so all of a sudden you're, you're having one month and it's as if you've been in business three years, right? You're adding depth, you're executing multiple layers at the same time. So that fandom and the athletes and the property is being experienced in a much larger way. So what we continuously hear is the, when are you ready to talk to us? What do you have next? What can we know? And I think that's very, very exciting. I think there's a challenge in what we're doing because for our fans, for the fandom, we have to stay so quiet, right? They're, they're, they're still, we're not, we can't be quite as transparent as we want to be because of the amount of infrastructure that's happening in strategic planning. Um, but for our partners who are in the business and understand the business, there's an incredible anticipation. And I think that's very exciting. It, yeah, it seems like with greatness on the ice with Wayne Gretzky, remember what he said, don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going. Yeah. Are we talking about the same thing in terms of running sports and entertainment companies, what's next? You said, what's next? If you where you are now, you're probably already too late. So well said, agree completely. Jared, I don't know if you want to comment to that. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's always been about skating to where the puck's going. You know, I've, I've, I've said for, for 20 years now, I mean, you, I've watched this escalation in, in the sports industry and you've had these incredible you know, uh, advancing valuations around sports, which we've, we've all been witnessing, participating in and, and, and watching. You, and you yet, could have said what a great job Sportico does on those valuations. And too, you know. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and, and look, I mean, Sportico, what you're doing on, on that is, is, is part of skating where the puck's going. I mean, you know, there is no equity research out there in sports that guys like us can rely on. And a lot of it's been anecdotal and now we're starting to professionally and obviously Forbes is out there and you guys are now really taking a run. That's skating to where the puck's going. That's bringing a business mentality. And if you, and, and as you watch capital, especially our kind of professionally formed capital come into sports more and more, 
you're going to see the rules change. You're going to see ownership change. Uh, you're going to see a different mentality. One of the things that Danny and Dwayne and I talk about all the time is that, that skating to where the puck's going. Because in order to, to do this today, there's so much competition for the fans' attention. And the one thing I'm learning just watching Danny and DJ is, you know, their, their engagement with their fans. It's so authentic. Um, it, it's at the heart of everything that they do. That's fantastic for sports because that's what sports needs to do, continue to do more and more of. Sports is, we've always said, Sky, by going back to 20 years ago when we launched the Yes Network, I mean, sports is the best must-carry content out there, right? In the old days, it was non tivoable right? That's still the case. You know, a Yankee Red Sox game in the Boston DMA or in the, in the New York DMA, that, that outrates everything. Um, but, you know, look, I mean, technology is disintermediated distribution. Uh, there's a lot more competition for uh, viewers, um, you know, for viewers. And, you know, the, 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 the um, aptitude of the younger generations is different than the aptitude of the older generations in terms of how they want to consume content. We all got to skate to where the puck's going. That's what we're trying to do here. That's yeah, going to be David, a big David thing. Stern always said, give the fans what they want, how they want, where they want it. And before you came on, Jerry, Danny had the, uh, I guess I'll call it fortune because I have to be nice, of meeting my son for a couple of minutes. So he is always my focus group of one. And then when his buddies come over, I can scale that to two, three, four, five. But they act so similarly. None of them will sit and watch a game. None of them. So... What does that tell you? What do you need to do if you can reach my son on the Xbox through video game, but not live event? If you can reach him on TikTok, what then what can I expect from the XFL in terms of the ability to put the arms around my kid who will not sit either live or on the couch and watch a two plus hour game? So, Jerry, I'm going to want to jump on that first. And Scott, I want to actually address that philosophically first. Sure. So in the sports world now and now as I get to live in it more and more this idea that you can't take a step first without agreeing to a relationship with your consumer is probably one of the most foreign concepts in sports and the mindset that sort of you know it's a transactional mindset and which is what it used to be it's understandable in film, in entertainment, in any IP that you're branding and, and is more entertainment driven, you immediately say, I start this and I'm going to have a relationship with my consumer. I don't care if they're three or 93. And that means I have to learn all those skill sets, open myself up, stay holistically, extremely broad in my concepts. So I'm not getting over a hurdle of, oh my God, how am I going to connect with them? Because I already agreed that connection is key to success. This is one of the huge innovative aspects that we get to do within the XFL because it's not a mental leap for us. So then if we're saying, how are we reaching them? There's no attachment to the fact that it used to be a three hour game or a two hour game or four. It's, that doesn't matter. It's switch the innovation, bring it down to the technology they like, because the fact is, it's not just about putting it in front of their eyes. It's making sure that we're meaningful so that he wants to wrap his arms around it. So you begin with that point of view, and then you start looking at the executions. The executions actually become more transparent. So that's Jared, let me ask you this. I've heard time and again from folks in sports that COVID has accelerated, and you can fill in the blank there. COVID was an accelerator. In terms of private capital in sports, what has COVID accelerated and what do you think the, we can extrapolate from that down the road? Well, look, I think when COVID hit um, in every industry, uh, there, were, there was capital that was looking for COVID trades. COVID trades didn't really happen. Um, there were some pockets of distress, but when you bring it back to sports specifically, since that's what we're talking about, you know, I would say that what, what the lesson coming out of COVID and maybe, I don't know if it accelerated it, Scott, but it certainly reinforced it, is the, um, the premium value of that content, that live event content. P people, if, if anything else, you know, and, and we were in the middle of uh, making our investment in, in Fenway Sports Group at the time. And I, what I took away from that whole COVID experience uh, was that we all got an appreciation for maybe something that we were taking a little for granted prior to COVID, which is, you know, that getting, getting 
humanity together in a, in a contained arena or stadium and watching a, a you know, a, a really dramatic event um, that provided great entertainment value. Look at what we're seeing right now with the run that the Red Sox are having. I mean, that's just great stuff, right? And COVID kind of reinforced that because when they when that was taken away from everybody, I think that that was a shock, right? Can you imagine life without any of that. Uh, and so that's I think that's the the most important point. The secondary point, look, I mean, capital has been finding sports, and you know, it's really interesting because. I, I, I'm of two minds on that. I, I think, you know, we, we've seen a lot of capital being formed generally. Uh, we've seen the SPAC phenomenon. We've seen, you know, um, uh, different, you know, a lot of capital chasing sports because sports, sports is one of those things I've, I've said for a while, sports is like the new Hollywood now. And what's interesting about sport, everything, everything seems to keep going up. And generally in investing in today's world, everything seems to keep going up. And, you know, my only caveat is to, you know, for everybody to just hold on for a minute. I mean, things, Things, everything going up all the time forever is not, that's, that's not possible and that's not Darwinian. That is not going to continue. Uh, and responsible capital has to come into the space. There's definitely a need for responsible capital in sports to continue to create businesses in partnership with rights holders. That's great for the ecosystem. You know, the COVID thing, I think it started with a lot of people looking for COVID trades and then there's a lot of capital around. We just got to sort of navigate through that um, because I don't think a, a ton of capital being poured into something um, is necessarily the you know best for the the ecosystem. Sure, sure would be nice though if you own the IP and the distribution channels, right? Why why are we not cutting out that middleman? Uh, you you said what sports is the new entertainment, Dan? Do you agree with that? Is it new or? Uh, I mean, you're out there in Hollywood. Is, is uh, I don't know if it's never, so new. I never contradict my partners in public. <laughs> well, actually, I, I I think that's a really Jared. I think that's a great reference, and you can see it with the. Uh, you can see it with the number of individuals flocking to sports as an investment vehicle, as a property. Um, the truth is, you know, the dynamic, sports is dynamic experience. It is content that you must see, as Jerry referenced earlier, to finally have individuals understanding that and understanding that value. It's, you know, you know, when they say you can't write this stuff when it's real life and it's better than, you know, a made up story, sports provides that on a weekly basis. So I think there is greater opportunities when people understand that the lens and the viewing and how you are discussing and how are you engaging with the content, knowing that that's actually an open door. Because I will say, uh, as entertainment sort of lands and wraps around sports, sports is behind, right? We know when it comes to the technology that you see or how you experience in content, a lot of that doesn't live in the sports property and that's an opportunity there. So, you know, it does make sense to me that the lens is there and that entertainment is so heavily and Holly and sports is the new Hollywood. One of the things I love Jerry about one of the companies you've invested in, you mentioned Fenway Sports Group, is that Fenway is a platform company. It's technology, it's real estate, it is content. And I think you, you need to view it that way these days of, of all the opportunities of buying sports teams. Now, you know what a prospective owner tells me these days? If it's just the team, I ain't interested. I need something else to, to sink my teeth into. I think the world is catching up to the John Henry notion, uh, whether it's Harris Blitzer, MSG, that the, the game itself, the, those teams, it's not enough. There's gotta be opportunity to scale far beyond just the games. And I'm just curious how you two view what folks are doing in the industry in terms of, the teams and brands is centerpieces to much bigger pies. Oh, look, there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you cross that proverbial billion dollar valuation threshold, these no, these no longer became, these no longer were your, you know, your the hobbies for, you know, uh, these, these became real businesses. And once they became real businesses, uh, you know, the, the, you, you bring other elements into it. They have to pay for themselves. There needs to, you know, capital needs to evolve around it. Uh, the rules, the ownership rules need to need to evolve. I mean, we keep seeing this progression in these valuations uh, and the people and the infrastructure that monetize that intellectual property and, and provide a value proposition, uh, both for the owners as well as for the fans, that needs to evolve. Uh, and look, I mean, you know, people, it's interesting, your anecdote that, you know, team owners or prospective team owners say, I need something more to sink my teeth to do. Let me tell you, there's, there's, there's also a math equation here, which is as these things get more and more pricey, 
uh, you need to find a way to buy down that valuation. And, you know, real estate, ancillary real estate around sports properties is, is one way to do it. And in fact, today, you know, for a while now, I've been saying that, you know, when you look at being a, a buying into a sports team, uh, you're, you're also very much a real estate developer. Uh, and that's been, that's been good business. Um, you know, it's all about when you, when you step back though, Scott, it's all about engaging the fan, right? The reason you're going to, the reason why in, in developing that ancillary real estate makes sense is on a risk adjusted basis, you are bringing people and traffic into that area. And you're only doing that if you're providing a value proposition and a, and a great piece of live event entertainment. So it all fits really well together. That's Danny's point, which is, you know, the new Hollywood concept is fascinating because, you know, there's an opportunity for sports to evolve and learn about how to engage fans. Uh, and, and they've been engaging them for a while, but the world's changed, right? Technology's disintermediated. There's a lot of competition. And I actually think that, you know, sports can learn a lot from, you know, some of Hollywood coming into this and really leaning into the entertainment aspect to it. Danny, let's get out on this. I'm curious, you know, sports has always been about wins and losses. That's how you've been judging success. Can you build around the entertainment aspect alone where a business model is not really um, determined by the scoreboard? I just want people to come in and be entertained and have a good time. You know, I can't guarantee you a win if I own a team, but I can guarantee that you're gonna come and have a good time. Is that enough? You know what that is? Well, there's, it's, there's, I would say the premise of that should be enough, right? Because the, the yes to that requires an incredible skill set. What you're agreeing to is so much of a dynamic experience that's not just the dynamic experience happening around the ball, right? So there's a fundamental, you can't say, right? Because there's two teams. So you, you, you commit to what are you going to see? How are you going to experience it? And I'm going to commit to that experience and that viewing opportunity to be as dynamic and engaging as possible, right? And then you begin to look at all of the other aspects of the universe around the football. So if you have the skill set, if you have the depth, and if you're used to that sort of width, right? Because it's many, many lanes that you're agreeing to control, you can say yes to that proposition. And I do think that comes down to ownership and the skill set and the smart capital that surrounds the property. But that agreement, to me, while it's much harder to execute on, in the longer term, gives you a much better success ratio as far as valuation and what is that value that you do. And I will say to you, Dwayne isn't a team, but if you were to look at him as an individual IP property, <laughs> okay? He, we never guarantee wins or losses with him. And this is one of the reasons why our Project Rock brand at Under Armour is so successful. We don't have to win Super Bowl championships. We don't win World Series. This individual, this athlete, who's not a professional athlete, has been able to develop around a brand, a concept that is about the journey and the experience so the wins and losses become secondary. That's, that philosophy doesn't translate exactly, but that, that idea that delivering more than just the win or the loss for the consumer says, yes, I'll be there because either way, that moment is going to mean something to me. And by the way, wins and losses are key. You need to have them. <laughs> That's what makes experience. We're talking about the experience of football. So I would say yes to your question. All right, Danny Garcia. Chair of the Garcia Company, Jerry Cardinal, founder of Redbird Capital. Thank you very much for taking the time. Great, thanks, Scott. Thanks.